Looking back over the year, I am so grateful for our entire Duke community for what they've done. You all have helped us to get our labs up and going again, to deliver patient care, and to continue our education. And everybody had to pull in the same direction to do that. Our people figured out how to care for patients in a very different environment. Taking care of the sickest of patients for almost a year now. What was amazing in the first two months of the pandemic is the rapid switch from in-person care to virtual care. They really believe in what they're doing and they believe in the goodness of what they're doing. That's extraordinary. In science and medicine, we never arrive at the truth, but we're always trying to move toward the truth. We have seen innovation in almost every aspect of managing COVID. We use the Regional Biocontainment Lab to actually work with the virus to understand how antibodies work against the virus. Our vaccine institute started to work on a SARS vaccine. We have the ability to go from bench to bedside. We have the entire arc of research development in-house. And then our clinical investigators were able to bring studies online in record speed. If you look back pre-COVID, it would have taken us several years to complete a study. And yet, during this past year, that cycle has occurred in weeks and months. The surveillance program was the work of literally hundreds of staff and faculty that developed a methodology to being able to constantly test the environment at Duke to look for early signals that we were having an outbreak. We are doing about 2,300 samples per day right now. We have capacity to go to 3,200 samples per day. It has served us well for the surveillance testing application. It became really a national model for how you do a rigorous surveillance program. Well, welcome everybody as you join this session. If you could please go ahead and share your video with us. It's always good to see everybody. We had to adapt to virtual education. And so our faculty were able to rapidly take the courses from in-person and really build a virtual platform. Unfortunately, our community reflected what was being seen in many communities across the country early in the pandemic, that infection, morbidity, and mortality was disproportionately occurring in vulnerable populations, whether they were black and brown populations or Latino populations. And so what that really did require is, is really rethinking our partnership with our own community. Everything from advocating for testing sites that were in the community to education materials that were appropriate, and now to vaccination strategies. it's just such a relief from what has built up over the last year. You know, on the one hand, that's great to see. On the other hand, you do realize that this year has taken its toll. I am very lucky to be surrounded by such extraordinary people. The very idea that we have a vaccine in such an incredibly short period of time validates why we have an academic health system and a research intensive school. That accomplishment couldn't be done without institutions like Duke constantly pushing the science, setting up the infrastructure, developing new technology. 
I am so proud of all our faculty, staff, and students for everything that you've done and all that you are doing. Your efforts, both in terms of keeping our campus and community safe, but also keeping all of our missions moving forward. Thank you to each and every one of you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to my State of the School as we approach the end of this academic year, our 2021 year. I think all of us can agree, as that video is aptly named, this year has been really like no other that we've experienced. So I'm gonna start my talk by the way I've ended all of my Friday chats with you throughout the pandemic, to thank you. Thank all of you for keeping us safe and for keeping our critical missions going because they were so important in helping us work through these challenges. So when I started my Dean's role, um, gosh, four years ago now, I had two guiding principles. One was the concept of one Duke, leveraging this incredible environment that spans all aspects of Duke to maximize our effectiveness and our impact. And the concept of service, that our success is facilitating the success of our faculty, staff, trainees, and students through strategic and effective support. Now those principles have all also guided us through COVID, but we had two other really important dominating principles in all our responses. That is focused on the safety and well-being of faculty, staff, students at the local, national, international communities, but also ensuring that we did not lose sight of our core missions, which not only gave us a sense of purpose, but were so important to working our, our way through this crisis. So as usual, I have a really hard time capturing the whole year in a very short talk. So I will give you snippets of this year, our milestones, major initiatives, and a look toward the future. But the crisis at hand has been COVID-19 and we're not quite out of the crisis, but we are really feeling the end of it. The pandemic has been unique in so many ways, unknowns, magnitude, duration, complexity, challenges, certainly to health, finances, psychological challenges, requiring all of us to be continuous problem solvers, decision makers in real time with innovation and flexibility. And all of you have shown those characteristics. So if you look at the definition of an academic medical center, it is really not surprising that these entities are absolutely critical to public health crises like COVID-19. We care for the sickest of patients, we make discoveries that transform how we care for patients. We lead healthcare policy and reform, educate the new generation of scientists and healthcare providers, and advocate for community members, both underserved and most vulnerable. Now, those core functions were described before COVID, but they have really, I think, described what our faculty, staff, and students have done throughout COVID. I can't possibly capture the whole year. What has kept me going is one story after another of what you all have done, but I'll give you a, a few of the milestones. We have cared for the sickest patients. We're one of the few sites that have ECMO. So we do get the sickest patients here. We've also seen a massive transition to virtual care platforms. March 17th, in record time, we scaled back vir virtually all of our clinical enterprise except for what could focus on COVID. And then we scaled it all back up, all labs being open by June 6. I think we were the fastest institution to do that, but we did it with safety protocols and processes in place. And I am so proud that we have no site outbreaks in any of our labs. We did the same for our clinical research mission. Our hundreds of our faculty were local and national experts advancing knowledge, policies related to COVID, whether it's working with our colleagues on campus in our local community and state and national level. As every, everybody now is very familiar with, we had a nationally recognized COVID-19 surveillance program that was a true partnership between uh, the School of Medicine, particularly HVI and the campus that became really a nationally recognized program of excellence. Historically, for the first time in our history, Duke University as a private institution received a $15 million grant from the state of North Carolina to fund the development of COVID vaccine and countermeasures. We received actually more than $254 million in funding for COVID in just 15 months in support of 94 projects, therapeutics, diagnostics, vaccine development, public health. HVI 
has, is on their way to a broad, broad spectrum coronavirus vaccine for the next coronavirus outbreak. Collaborated with RTI to become the coordinating center for NIAID's newly established Center for Research and in Emerging Infectious Disease Networks. We established for the first time in our history an outpla outpatient clinical research site in the community, initially certainly for COVID therapeutic and vaccine trials, but now we have it to really partner with our community going forward. We played a very strong presence in the national vaccine efforts. David Montefiore's lab is a GCLP compliant laboratory program that set up the assessment of neutralizing antibody responses in clinical trials. It is an international resource. We led in national COVID research programs, many through, from DCRI, the HERO program, the RADx uh, diagnostic program for underserved populations, the, the therapeutic and, and vaccine trials through the COVID, accelerating COVID therapeutic interventions, and now the coordinating center for a new COVID-19 active uh, program study. The Latinx advocacy team and interdisciplinary network for COVID-19 established a multidisciplinary uh, uh, community advocacy group to improve access to testing, contact tracing, and care for the Latinx community that has had enormous impact. And then investigators in DCRI partnered with our school districts in the creation of the ABC Collaborative, a nationally recognized program to help create sound policies and guidelines for opening schools through the pandemic. These are just snippets of our milestones and impact. In terms of our, our education, everybody has seen a remarkable transformation of education. It, it had to go online, continuous improvement in remote platforms for learning, our virtual PA, our PhD dissertations, defenses were done virtually, virtual interviewing for our incoming classes. Now telehealth is part of our education platform in terms of training our healthcare professional students in how to engage patients in that platform. New courses came up responding to the pandemics, our moral moments in medicine. Play Posit, which is an interactive video program with case-based modules and virtual platforms for, for rounding. And we have got to use this experience, as challenging as it was, to really inform us going forward. It is absolutely clear to me that academic medical centers like Duke are critical institutions in public health crises. But that means we must continue to build our infrastructure, advance our science and technology, enrich our faculty to be ready for the next crisis. We were pretty prepared for this crisis. We had a biocontainment lab, we had a vaccine institute, we had incredibly talented faculty, but we have to keep renewing ourselves. The experience reinforced the critical role of all of our missions in working through this kind of crisis and really heightened the need to be vital community partners. We learned that we can do things faster, more efficiently, and with extraordinary collaboration and we must continue to examine the root causes of health disparities that were so on display with this pandemic. So we, never let a, we should never let a good crisis go to waste, and we need to all learn from this experience and inform the future of our institutions, particularly here at Duke, and make us be strong advocates for change outside our institutions. So where are we now? Vaccination update for Duke is quite good. 81.2% of the university workforce has been fully vaccinated, 73% of the health system workforce, 85.4% of the School of Medicine is now fully vaccinated, and about 9,300 students. Now, our community is, is good as well, our state not so good, and as you all know, there are pockets of communities throughout the country that have not achieved vaccination rates that will protect the community, so we must continue to be strong advocates for vaccination. Now, in terms of our grant portfolio, we, we didn't miss too much here and we recovered very rapidly through April. We have about 175 million recovered in indirect costs and we're 5.7% higher than previous years. And we are starting to return to work. We expect an increased number of staff to return to campus beginning July in 2021. And we, we we see that there'll be a phase in of on-site staffing over time, but as you know, return to work decisions 
We really encourage to be managed locally by department centers and units with guidance and assistance provided from the School of Medicine Administration. And there's actually a website, remotework.duke.edu, that can help make uh, informed decisions. But you should also stay tuned for updated policies on vaccination and masking, which we're ex expecting to come in the next week. So not everything we did was COVID this year. In fact, we have several new leaderships that we were able to bring to bring on and 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 not only bring into our institution, but but um, to uh, have searches within our own institution. So in terms of senior leadership, Sufi Chen is our new chair of Department of Dermatology, and we recruited her from from Emory. Rashid Gadagisin is associate dean for Physician Science Scientist Development. Adrian Hernandez is the Vice Dean and Executive Director of the Duke Clinical Research Institute. Susanna Nagy is the Vice Chair for Clinical Research. And Aditi Naran is the Associate Dean for Curricular Affairs. Now I'm gonna go through a sampling of honors that our faculty have received. I can't possibly cover them all, but they are an indication of how our institution, our faculty are viewed nationally. And we continue to excel in that regard with memberships at the very highest honorary societies of, oops, across the country. I'm gonna go through these fairly fast, but I have put everybody's picture names so you'll be able to see them. Um, so American Society for Clinical Investigation, three new members, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, four new female members, uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science Fellows, and the Barrows Welcome Fund 2021 Investigators in the Pathogenesis of Infectious Diseases. Now we did not have just one, we had three of these honor, uh, of our faculty received this honor when no other institution had more than one. And then within our own institution, the highest honor is distinguished professorships. And we had a number of faculty from basic science and clinical departments to achieve that honor this year. The presidential awards recognize individuals and teams from the university and health system who best demonstrate the values that define and shape Duke as an institution and is the highest honor given by Duke. So many of our teams and individuals were recognized this year, largely through the work they've done around COVID-19, but also for the work we are doing to really realize our goals of being a diverse, welcoming and inclusive institution. So what about some milestones? Um, you know, usually in the spring, we start to get a little bit uh, anxious about the US News and World Report rankings. I can tell you this year, we didn't even think about it. And all of a sudden it came out and our medical school was number three. So maybe the lesson is we shouldn't think about it anymore, but we are so proud of that ranking. And seven specialty programs in the School of Medicine placed within their top 10 surgery, anesthesiology, internal medicine, radiology, pediatrics, OBGYN, and psychiatry. That's an incredible, incredible recognition. But there are other important rankings. For instance, I really like the Student Doctor Network because this actually looks at how students evaluate medical schools. And in that ranking, we're number three. And around, um, among the world university rankings, we rank number 10 in US medical schools uh, in international rankings. So we have a lot to be proud of. Now, an interesting part of the ranking that wasn't actually factored in, but was um, calculated this year was a new diversity ranking. Duke tied 20th nationally out of 118 medical schools. And just to walk you a little bit through this ranking, it's based on two indicators, the number of underrepresented students enrolled, but also the ratio of the school's underrepresented students either to state or national numbers. So if you're a state school, it's relative to your state. And if you're a private school, it's relative to the national numbers. And so as you can see here, Duke is one of the very top private schools, which I'm very proud of, but you know, not satisfied. Um, but I am sure that this type of data, which I think is, is much more informative, is actually gonna be part of rankings going forward. Now, before COVID, uh, probably about three years ago, although I've lost all track of time, our med ed leadership engaged in an exercise to think about what are the skills that our training physicians will need 10 plus years down the road. And then they started to think about how do we need to change our curriculum to train our students with those skills. That work 
was, was deep and it was iterative. And at the end of the process, we invited us uh, education scholars from outside Duke to come in and look at our plans, which informed an, another iterative cycle. And now we have the new patient first MD curriculum. And there's lots to this and I can't possibly go through it, but the one part I want to talk about, which has already started, is the immersion course, or what we, you might call the clinical boot camp. It's a two-week immersion in basic clinical skills and professional identity. POCUS, I had to ask, is actually pay, uh, that's the, uh, the site of care ultrasound for, for students, social context in Durham. This course was, was rolled out this year and it was incredibly successful with the feedback among the very top and Really, I think the students have acknowledged this is a keeper. And the course director, Dr. Julian Hertz, is a beloved director. But there's a lot more to our curriculum reform. I'm going to keep you informed as different parts roll out. As you can see here, certainly the foundations of patient care one and two is a really integrated course, bringing a lot of concepts together, basic science, clinical science, cultural determinants of health. And then there's aspects of innovation. So pilots in data science, pop health, clinical informatics, design health and then advances in clinical training, including in a longitudinal ambulatory um, experience. In terms of our research mission, um, we did open a, re a new research campus in the Research Triangle Park. The work on this had started pre-COVID. This is now officially open. Um, and it's just so you know, it's called the Duke Research and Discovery at RTP. 20, 273,000 square feet, which really has helped us decant some of our space on campus. And Tom Denny is the new associate dean of that campus. There's some, some overarching research themes that we're developing out there. One is in host defense, and the other is development of new countermeasures for emerging and re-emerging pathogens, which obviously is incredibly timely. So besides COVID, um, we have had some other major initiatives. So as most of you who participated in my state of the school last year know that in, 20, in June 2020, we launched our Moments to Movement um, strategic planning process entitled Dismantling Racism and Advancing Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion in the School of Medicine. This process was deep and broad and was incredibly intensive. Now the whole plan has been collated and put together with a downloadable PDF, which will be on the website next week. I encourage all of you to take a look at it. And with, we will, we'll start reporting highlights in July and go around to various units to really start, start um, going through what this plan looks like. And then we'll update you on the plan going forward with month, monthly in the ODI newsletter. But just to, to talk to you a little bit through the process, as I said, this was broad and deep with very, very uh, exciting engagement. We had four constituent groups representing health professional students, grad students and postdocs, faculty and staff. And as you can see, each, each group had co-chairs as well as a number of participants. And then these groups then, then engaged broader groups in task force and um, survey, uh, uh, survey mechanisms to really get the input of our broad community. Now, I can't go through the details of, of the plans. Each committee came up with 60 to 70 pages of recommendations, and that has all been collated into an overarching plan. But the details are quite significant and will inform down to specific tactics um, the pathway forward. But these are the high level goals. goals. First, to go cultivate inclusive, equitable and an anti-racist environment through a number of initiatives to attract, nurture and reward outstanding talent. And this goes everything from how we search for faculty and students, how we nurture them when they're here and how we recognize accomplishments in our community. Advanced education and training to support an anti-racist workforce. And this is not only about the curriculum that we teach our students, but it's a training platform for everybody at Duke. Now we are doing this planning in collaboration and in parallel with the campus and with, with Duke Health. And a lot of these concepts will be similar across the entity. To develop an anti-racist, equity-centered, and community-engaged research practices, really thinking about how we engage our community in research and how we use our research power to understand health disparities. 
ensure sustainability by strengthening leadership capacity and organizational accountability. This is about the qualities that we look for in a leadership uh, position, particularly core competencies around equity, diversity, and inclusion, but also how we search for those leaders, really looking for an intentional process for increasing the number of BIPOCs, BIPOC individuals in leadership positions and strengthen our foundation for accountability and sustainability. So in year one, we have a number of goals that we will implement. First is my search for a vice dean for diversity, equity, inclusion. This search process is well in its way. We had a phenomenal search team that came up with a, a wonderful uh, list of candidates and they have vetted them and presented um, the top candidates to consider for this really important role. This role will be my partner to work across our institution to take the roadmap, the plan, and really start a, a, a deep implementation process. We did put in Duke as an institution to the NIH Faculty Institutional Recruitment for Sustainable Transformation Program or the Cluster Hire Program. Um, we did set up a community research site, which was for COVID, but now that will be available for us to really engage across a number of uh, areas, uh, our community in clinical research. We wanna collaborate with the university to develop independent, accessible and low barrier referral hub for reporting and resolving discrimination and harassment concerns. And through Ebony's leadership, the C Ebony Bowers leadership and CTSI, launch the Pathway Center to enhance connections and diversity across research and academic medicine pipeline from middle school through faculty. We'll review and lead reorganization of, a student, affair, of student affairs to enhance student support. And with the university, develop a process for pay equity analyses and reporting and enhance faculty advancement systems and processes. And this is just the first year. But there's a lot of details and I really encourage you all to read the report and then roll up your sleeves because this is gonna take everybody to really participate in what I think is institutional transformation. So another big issue, uh, area we have been working on is planning for the future of Duke Health's clinical enterprise. So the clinical, um, the clinical organization came up with an exciting strategic plan uh, and has also gone through reignited a process to look at our organizational structure as we look toward the future. So the, the clinical strategic plan, as I said, is exciting and it's got a lot of detail, but if you just look at the high level goals, lead in clinical excellence, forge our digital future, build an indispensable network, advance health equity and foster joy in work. Now under these high level goals it is a lot of detail and a lot of work to be done, but we can't do that work unless we become a more facile and integrated organization that minimizes the barriers to success. So our current state, as most of you are aware, is a little bit complex. Um, obviously the School of Medicine and the School of Nursing sit in, in Duke University. Duke Health is on the Board of Trustees, uh, is our Duke Health system that has our hospitals, our hospital-based clinics, and Duke Primary and Urgent Care, as well as Home Care and Hospice. And then many of our practices are in the private diagnostic clinic, which is a separate organizational structure tightly connected to Duke. Now, it is a separate organizational structure. And just to give you some of the differences that highlight some of the challenges in really being able to realize our clinical plan is Duke University Health System is non-for-profit. Private Diagnostic Clinic is for-profit. There's separate contracting with insurers separate business strategies and financial systems. There is very limited ability to share risk and growth, largely because of some real legal barriers. So if we think about um, the environment that we're in now, it is very different than the environment when our structures were created and when they have thrived. For instance, reimbursement is changing from fee-for-service to value-based care. We need to be more adept at implementing these reimbursement models. Our patients encounter complex, hard to navigate systems that sometimes dilutes the quality of their patient experience. We must provide integrated, excellent care. Patients have choices and expectations and we need to be able to meet them. Duke Health is the fifth largest health system in North Carolina. Our competitors are outpacing us in the market and we must align better 
to better position ourselves for growth and future success. And alignment will enable Duke to appropriately and competitively pay and support our providers and staff across our clinical enterprise. Our faculty's clinical effort is in the PDC, not in the university, which makes it extremely difficult to manage total faculty effort according to today's expectations of our research funding organizations. And in fact, as decided by the university leadership, all clinical faculty who conduct research through Duke must have clinical and research academic effort in the School of Medicine by, Ju by July 1st, 2022. We do know that our academic missions are a core part of Duke Health and that the success of our academic and clinical missions are tightly linked. The growth and success in the clinical mission supports the growth and success in our academic mission. So for all those reasons, there has been a team of leadership that has made incredible progress in the last couple of months to come up with a single organizational structure where all of our clinical mission is under the chancellor in the university and a new position, the physician practice as uh, senior vice president oversees the platform of ambulatory operations that not only includes our clinical, our, excuse me, that not only includes our community physician groups, but also includes all the practices that sit within our academic departments. Department chairs will continue to lead in our clinical and academic missions, but the faculty, but they will work with the dean to, to manage faculty um, clinical research and education effort within the School of Medicine. So with that, we do believe that we can build a better Duke Health with shared goals that I think all of us would agree, agree are the goals that we want to achieve. Now, in terms of the progress for uh, the, the reorganization, starting July 1 of this year, the Duke Family Medicine and Community Health Department will be the first department to move into a new clinical organization. And we're working with all the departments um, to really plan for the future. So another big initiative that we have not lost focus on is the Duke Science and Technology Initiative. This was started pre-COVID, probably about three years ago. It was really focused on um, enhancing science and technology at Duke through an ambitious recruitment of new faculty. Um, we all know that science is a driver of academic excellence and innovation, but it was recognized that Duke had some unmet potential relative to our mission and to our peers and that we had somewhat underinvested as an institution in science and technology. So with that, um, we had, got, had um, been given from the Duke Endowment three years ago, a $50 million catalytic uh, grant. And we've recently got another $50 million from the Duke Endowment to advance science and technology research. This is the largest award that the university has ever received and will continue to support our Duke Tech Science and Technology Initiative. So with that, it will enable the campus and the School of Medicine to recruit and retain exceptional scientific leaders across the broad domain of science and technology. Now, part of the Science and Technology Initiative is a continued focus on fundraising with three central themes. One very relevant to the School of Medicine is the theme of biologic or biologic resilience, fortifying the body and brain. This is really the basic science the underpinning of health and disease. But some of the other themes are very relevant to the School of Medicine as well. For instance, material science. And a lot of the work in material science is around healthcare devices. And then computing, certainly the importance of data science to the School of Medicine and to health in general is really part of our future. So all of the themes of science and technology will advance the School of Medicine as well. Now we've had tremendous success in our first two plus years of the Science and Technology Initiative and, and have recruited five outstanding fac new faculty members in a number of departments and across the spectrum of career development from brand new faculty to senior faculty. 
Uh, I think three or actually four of uh, the, these new faculty are here already and have established their labs even during COVID. So we, we are very proud of who we have been able to recruit to Duke under the Science and Technology Initiative. We've also collaborated with campus, and I think this is really um, one of the exciting aspects, is to really look for hires where we can leverage science in one area with science and, and, um, and health in another area. So two of those examples are Matt Becker, whose expertise is biomaterials and has an appointment in chemistry, engineering, and orthopedic surgery, and Cameron McIntyre, whose expertise is in deep brain stimulation and his appointment in biomedical engineering and neurosurgery. And then we worked with campus to retain Charlie Gersbach, whose expertise is gene therapy and has appointments in BME, orthopedic surgery, and cell biology. So going forward, we want to maintain our momentum in the science and technology initiative, but we really want to be thoughtful about our hiring processes, particularly informed by the work in a diversity and inclusion efforts, and to really put inclusive excellence as part of our science and technology initiative. We want to reaffirm our commitment to interdisciplinary and collaborative research and partner with other schools within the university and excitingly leverage two new presidential distinguished chairs. Now, these are new chairs that were established to support the science and technology. They're $5 million chairs, and we have had the good fortune to have two chairs given to us in the last year. We want to realize a vision of DST that is a force multiplier for existing colleagues and collaborators. So we are initiating a new round of nominations. Now, how do we support our missions? This continues to be the daily work of, of all of us to think about how do we provide the best support for, for our growing research mission. So our federal research funding has increased quite impressively. Um, with fairly stable funding for an increase slightly in funding from foundations, a little decrease in funding from industry. So if you look at Blue Ridge ranking of NIH funding, we are 10th. But if you go to the right of the column, we are one of the highest institutions in terms of grant dollars per PI, I think we're third. Um, and we've seen an impressive 8.8% growth in our NIH funding over 2019, which is just extraordinary. If you look at our portfolio of funding, it has changed somewhat in the last 10 years. So we have seen a greater dependence on foundation funding and federal non-NIH funding. So we have had an extraordinarily successful year in philanthropy. We had a goal of 103 million and now we have commitments of 140 million, 136 of which is to support the School of Medicine. We have 49 new million more new commitments toward our School of Medicine and Endowment. And as I mentioned, we have a, a new uh, way to support faculty through the Presidential Distinguished Chairs in Science, Science and Technology, and we received two of them this year, as well as the Boyce Haller Professorship in Nephrology. In terms of our research support, we continue to be so fortunate to partner um, with the Nanolin Duke Fund, who extended the Strong Start program supporting early physician scientists with a $7 million grant. And then the Duke Endowment gave us $2.6 million to establish our community-based outpatient clinical research site in Durham. We also started a COVID research fund, which is several hundred thousand dollars, which is incredibly important uh, discretionary dollars that we use throughout the year to support many projects where that was the start and now they are funded projects. But perhaps for me, the most gratifying gift that we received this year was a $30 million gift from the Rao Family Foundation to support need-based scholarships. This is the single largest scholarship gift that the School of Medicine has ever received. But more, more importantly and personally to me, I had the opportunity to meet Dudley Rao uh, several years ago because he had already given a scholarship to a merit-based scholarship for students. And his passion was really engaging and supporting students. Unfortunately, he passed away unexpectedly, but his family foundation continued to focus on his passion, which was supporting students. And now with this gift, 
we intend to lower the debt burden of all of our students requiring a need-based support. And, and really my goal is that anybody that um, makes a decision to come to Duke makes a decision not based on uh, the debt burden, but more based on the fact that this is the best school for them. So what are our key priorities going for in the future? They're similar to the things that I've talked about tonight. We must implement the School of Medicine Diversity and Inclusion Strategic Plan. As I said, it is deep and broad and will transform our school, but it's gonna take a lot of hard work and it's gonna take all of your participation. We need to continue to focus on our people and culture. We know this year has been a significant challenge to all of us, and we need to focus on our faculty, staff, and student wellness, professionalism, really developing a culture of respect and scientific accountability. We will successfully work with our colleagues across the health system and the PDC to successfully transition Duke Health to a new clinical practice model and build on the beginning of the science and technology initiative. But I wanna end with what I think a passion we all share, which is our commitment to educating the next generation of health professionals and biomedical scientists. So this year was a year where all of our, all of our programs had to use virtual interviewing and virtual visits. And obviously nobody had, had very clear um, vision as to what that would look like. But if you just look across our programs, the MD program, physician assistant program, physical therapy, master's in biomedical science, occupational therapy and PhD programs, We've done extraordinarily well within a group of talented, passionate, and incredibly diverse candidates that have chosen to come to Duke. Now, I put an asterisk by the occupational therapy program because that is our latest health professional program. This is the first year that program admitted students, and they way overshot. Got many more students than they'd actually planned, which is a good success. But again, I mean, a diverse group of an exciting uh, group of students that are the future for Duke. And when I asked Kathy Kuhn how our residency programs did, because they also interviewed virtually, um, they did just as well. For our, our 217 matriculants in our resident the PGY1 and PGY2 years coming, all, again, diverse for the first year, 56% uh, percent are women. So the first year we flipped the male, the female to male ratio. And again, a very diverse and exciting group of candidate uh, residents that have chosen to continue their careers here. So I'll end in that note because I think our future is bright. And largely it's because of the people that choose to come and train here often stay here and build their careers here. And with that, I will again, thank all of you for everything that you've done to really navigate this, this incredible crisis and I am looking forward to the new year. So thank you. And I know that I have a few questions that I will take a quick look here. Um, will PA students be eligible to receive need-based scholarships or just MD students? Well, that gift from Dudley Rao is for medical students, but we have prioritized scholarship uh, opportunities for all of our programs. So we are looking for donors to actually follow Dudley Rao's footsteps and, and allow us to offer scholarships across our programs. Why do you anticipate the average debt base be reduced to FY22? What do you anticipate? So we haven't done the full calculation uh, yet. And some of that really is based on um, looking at our full uh, financial needs of our class coming in and then matching it with the uh, endowment. So, but we do think that we are gonna make a significant impact and we'll be able to actually give that number very soon. And with that, I would like to thank you. Uh, hope all of you have a lovely evening and looking forward to the year ahead. Take care.